What is up, everybody? I am Kevin Ioli. Welcome. I appreciate you joining me. And joining me right now, my guest is one of the best fighters in the world. Uh, at UFC 299 in Miami on March 9th, he will be in a five-round bout in the co-main event against Benoit Saint-Denis. Dustin Poirier is my guest. Hi, Dustin. How are you? What's happening, man? Man, dude, I have to say, you know, you are a 9-5 to five underdog in this fight. And I went back and I looked at from since 2017 – who you have fought, and I think everyone was either a champion, a former champion, or in the top three or four. And you're an underdog to somebody who I don't think has ever fought a top ten opponent. Like, it, does the math work there to you? Hey, these odds makers must see something that that they think they they know. I, I have no clue. Yeah. Wait, were you surprised when UFC came to you with that matchup? Uh, and, and I don't say this in any way trying to uh, denigrate uh, Benoit, but he has not had the kind of opponents that you've had. He hasn't had that big step up. And he's going way up in the rankings from, I believe, number 11 to number three. So from your standpoint, when they came to you with it, did you say, where's the upside for me in this? A little bit. At first, when I heard the name, I was like, what? What are you guys talking about? Because I, I thought it would be a, a former champ or one of the guys in the top or a legacy, you know, a legacy type of fight, something like that. But when they said his name, I was like, OK, this young hungry lion, that, that's what we're doing. OK, let's see. Let's find out if I still got it. Yeah. So and I, I'm sure you feel like after a full training camp down there with those killers you train with, uh, you still have it, right? I definitely feel like that. Let's uh, before we move on, can you just kind of clarify the controversy that came up? So uh, when when you said you were out of the fight and then you were you know, a couple hours later back in, what happened? So, you know, I know you said there was a misunderstanding, but can you clarify sort of what happened? Because it was really kind of a puzzling couple of hours there. Yeah, the fight's happening. That's all everybody needs to know. I don't want to get into it, but me and my management hadn't spoken in three days. I kept messaging them back. I was waiting on something to hear from them. I told them, I said, hey, if I forget what day it was. It might have been a Tuesday or a Thursday. I said, if by Thursday, you guys don't get back to me. I was speaking to my management. I said, I'm out. I'm going to fly back home. I'm away from my family. Um, I didn't hear back from him that morning. I went to the gym. I said, you know what? Then I'm out. If you guys didn't hit me back, I'm out. And uh, But we got it all figured out. Okay, good. Well, that's the, that is the important thing. Um, now, now, I got a kick out of the fact, I don't know if you saw some of the social media reaction. Uh, Joe Rogan had said a couple of days earlier on his podcast, hey, you know, Dustin Poirier better be careful because Benoit Saint Denis is a killer. Look in his eyes and everything. And all of a sudden, there was a school of uh, thought out there. Well, Dustin Poirier heard the Joe Rogan podcast and is, is a little bit worried about what he's facing now. Huh? I, I do listen to the Rogan podcast. But I, I didn't listen to that one. Okay, that, that was that was pretty funny. What do you make of Benoit, and, uh, and where do you think uh, he's vulnerable from what you see? I mean, he's only lost one time uh, by decision, you know, at a weight class above what he's fighting at against a big guy. I, I don't know how short notice it was or anything, but really showed grit. I think he's a dangerous, young, hungry guy, um, you know, with everything to gain. So right. that, that's, that's what I'm expecting. He's very dangerous. I haven't really seen a whole lot of weaknesses. I mean, he's been taking guys down, um, stopping guys with strikes. Seems seems pretty well-rounded. Sometimes the conventional wisdom, Dustin, would be you have everything to lose and nothing to gain, right? But, you know, you, um, you had the loss to Gaethje, uh, and, and, you know, you're coming off uh, that also the Charles Oliveira loss. So I wonder if, like, maybe it's flipped the switch, right? If you a guy that's got a lot of hype behind him all of a sudden, if you go in there and you can handle a guy like that, does that put you right back in the mix for a uh, title eliminator, you know, keep you right in that title hunt anyways with a win over this guy? I think – my track record and what I've done throughout my career, I'm one finish, one big win away from a top guy or a title fight at all times. Mm -hmm. Just where I'm at, what I've done in my in my my career. Sure. Yeah. Um, but what was enticing about this matchup was to find out. This was like a me looking at myself in the mirror thing. I'm 35 years old. You know, this guy's 27 or 28. Finished his last five opponents. Obviously, like if you look at the fights that I've taken against the gate, like Gaethje, I didn't have to take that fight, but it was it made me nervous. So I felt like I had to do it. The obstacle is the way. That's that's what we're doing here, man. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, to get to it, you got to get through it. And uh, so I'm gonna stand in front of this young, hungry guy and and test myself. That's that's what I'm doing here. This is exciting. 
you know, you you came out uh, what a decade or and a half or so ago, right? A young guy that was all hungry and you know had had all these big plans. And now I look at you, and you, you know, your nose is kind of like a country road, you know, curving around. And you know, you sacrificed your body for your family in this sport, right? And I wonder when you look at it, like. Uh, you know, what is it like to be you on non-fight camp days when you're waking up in the morning? I mean, do you feel all those years and all those big fights when you try to get yourself up out of bed and get, get moving in the morning? Yeah, man, of course. I have 50 fights. Um, I've been doing this for 17 years straight. But since I was 18 years old, I've been, I've been fighting nonstop. Uh, you know, I've had a few surgeries along the road. Um, what we do isn't good for you. Of course okay. I feel it. So, so what motivates you now to keep going? Because, you know, you, you've made a great living. You've been at the top of the game. Um, you know, what is the motivation now? I know what it was back then, right? What is the motivation now? Yeah, me, me and my family are comfortable. That's the dangerous word that fighters can't, can't yeah. use or get too comfortable with is being comfortable. But I still have discipline. And I, at the end of the day, when all this goes away, I still love fighting. I love testing myself. I love being scared. I love throwing myself in the fire. I'm addicted to that. That the the theater of the unknown. When those lights come on and those cameras are rolling and nobody's coming to save you, there's a hungry guy in front of you. Swim or drown. I love something about that. I still love. And I can still do it with the best in the world. So I'm definitely towards the end, but I'm still healthy. I still feel good. And I still love it. That's the main thing. Do you plan uh, when, whenever the day comes that you're no longer an active fighter, do you plan to stay in the business in any way? I would, I mean, it's been part of my life pretty much for as long as it hasn't been, you know, half of my life I've been involved with combat sports, whether it was boxing or MMA. Uh, so I have to be a part of it somehow, whether I'm helping the local guys or, you know, I, I'm definitely going to, I'll never be fully away from this sport. It, it's, it's given me everything I have. It's helped me become the person I am. It's put me and my family in a great spot. Um, I, res I respect this, you know, the grind of it. And uh, it's something I'm always going to be part of. Can you ever see yourself doing something like Mike Brown did, right? Mike Brown went from being a world champion fighter, highly respected guy. And now, you know, he, he's considered among the elite coaches uh, in the business, you know, the top two, three, four coaches in the business. Can you so see yourself dedicating another part of your life to other fighters is on a regular basis, not just helping the local guys out. I'm definitely not against it. I love helping the guys uh, here in South Florida, like Johnny Eblen, when he's in camp, I'll come fly out. I'll, I'll corner him or Sabah Hamasi. If I can help, you know, with the career I've had and knowledge, pieces of knowledge that I've picked up along the way, if I can sprinkle that into their careers and their lives and try to guide them, you know, of course, I, I love being around that. And I love seeing the, the hunger in these guys' eyes and how hard they work. I love seeing that, man. Uh, it gets me excited because I remember when I was, well, I'm talking about guys who are world champions now. You know, Johnny right. Evelyn's a world champion. But even guys lower in their, younger in their pro career, um, I, I enjoy being around that. The thing is, I, I just, I'm not going to uproot my family and move to a, a place like South Florida to, to be around a, a super gym like American Top Team to, to right. dedicate myself to that. I, I wouldn't do something like that. If the sport continues to grow the way it is, and Louisiana keeps growing in their fight scene. If something like that would ever happen in Louisiana and I could be close to home, I'm, I'm all, I would 100% do it. How proud of you were, uh, were you of Johnny, by the way, uh, uh, his fight the other day against him, uh, uh, he got cracked really big. It looked like he was in trouble. Mike had finished there for a minute and, and boy, he was impressive how he survived that second round and then third round kind of controlled it and, and got the win. I mean, we knew what kind of fighter he is and what kind of, person he is we know he has heart we just don't want to ever have to see him show it because you know yeah. it's, it's getting rough in there uh, i think if he would have had two more rounds it would have kept uh going his his way more and more so you know he's definitely a five-round fighter but i was really surprised when he got hurt but he went back to his wrestling kept himself safe survived it you know that's just that's fighting that's what it is that's sure. fighting I, last thing I want to ask you about, um, when you look at the UFC now, to me, I, I think the level of talent is better than it's ever been, right? And you have more depth from one to 20 than you, you know, maybe in a division before you had four or five guys. Now it seems like you have 10, 15 or more, or more guys. Do you see that, you know, the sport evolving and do you see the level of talent being greater than it has ever been? 100%, man. This, it's an evolution. 
every year it's going to keep leveling up. You know, I, I see it in the gym with, with young guys. I, I, they, they come into the gym and they're doing stuff. I didn't know two years of my pro, pro career, you know, um, they're starting out as young as at a way younger age than the previous fighter generation did. They have way more content. Fights are on every weekend. There's way more stuff to break down, way more techniques to try, way more training partners. Everything is on the rise and the sport and the techniques are continue to grow. They will continue to grow for mm -hmm. sure. UFC 299 on March 9th at the Casilla Center in Miami. Dustin Poirier will be in the co-main event against Benoit Saint-Denis. Good luck, Dustin. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, man. Good to see you.